Hi, and welcome to the show. My name is Dr. Ramon Chowdhury, and I'm here with Ram Sriracha, uh, the head of machine learning at Splunk. Ram, it's really good to meet you. Thanks, Ramon. It's great to be here. Um, I would love to learn a little bit more about your background. I know we, we're here today to talk about ethical AI and responsible AI, um, but I'd love to hear more about your journey to machine learning. Yeah. Uh, so at Splunk, I lead uh, the Applied Research Group, which does machine learning research. I also lead uh, security research at Splunk. Uh, prior to Splunk, I was uh, in big data machine learning space. Um, uh, at some point of time, I was at Yahoo Research uh, working in uh, large scale machine learning and so on. So uh, this is a very exciting for me to be here. Uh, ethical AI is timely. It is uh, something that's top of mind, both privacy and ethics are top of mind at Splunk as well. So this is a great time uh, to be talking to you about it. So that's really interesting. So the field of AI ethics, so a little bit of background about myself would probably be helpful. Um, I'm a data scientist and a social scientist, and I've been working in the field of responsible and ethical AI for some years now. Um, and as a data scientist, for me, it was interesting to be part of developing this new field from an applied sense. Um, and I, I mean applied in terms of like a mathematical or, or applied machine learning sense, as, to, as opposed to an applied sociological or social science sense. Um, but I'm curious to, to you know, understand a little bit about you know, how you think of responsible ethical AI, and in particular, you know, how or where might it fit into the kind of work you're doing at Splunk. Yeah. So uh, so for us, it's, uh, by the way, I come more from a computer science sort of background. So uh, I think of uh, algorithmic fairness and things like that a lot. Um, uh, and um, both privacy as well as fairness are really important uh, and are topics that we are grappling with at Splunk. Particularly, uh, and not, not just Splunk, I think, in the enterprise itself when you're doing enterprise AI. Right. Uh, particularly, I think it's really important uh, when we are deploying machine learning systems that eventually end up automating something. Uh, it is important to deal with fairness. It's important to deal with um, privacy. Um, uh, so that, that's the angle from which I'm approaching it. Uh, so, uh, But also as a computer scientist, it's interesting for me to think about what sort of guarantees you can have when you think of fairness. Right. So can you have fair algorithms that are just as accurate as non-fair algorithms? Probably not, right? Uh, so where do you make that trade-off between fairness and accuracy? Once you have privacy and fairness and accuracy, then you have three things that may not be mutually compatible, right? Uh, so it's really interesting to think about, uh, you know, for societal good, how do you think about this framework, right? How do you think of privacy, security, as well as um, ethics uh, when it comes to building accurate machine learning models? So do you see those three um, as being fundamentally at odds, or at the very least, the notions of privacy and ethics to fundamentally be at odds with accuracy? And I'm putting a pin in the term accuracy yeah. um, because I would love to have a discussion on even the concept of accuracy in the setting. So do, yeah. do you see there being an inherent trade-off to it? Is it will always be the case that we need to, let's say, sacrifice um, model goodness for a lofty moral goal? So uh, this is a really hard question. Um, and I would preface it by saying that we are very early in the ethical AI kind of literature as well as in science, right? So probably anything I'm going to say now is going to be outdated or uh, pretty soon. Uh, but uh, quite a bit of recent research has told us that at least we have a good theoretical way to understand privacy, right? notions of differential privacy and so on, allow us to make a good trade-off between accuracy and privacy. But even, even there, you do need to make some sort of a trade-off, right? You, you can't, it's, there's no free lunch. But at least you can reason about the sort of trade-off you have to make. In terms of fairness, I think it is much harder, at least today. It is well understood that common notions of fairness, at least the things that computer scientists can dream of, uh, you can show that not all of them can hold at the same time. Right? So there are notions of fairness that seem completely reasonable, but just cannot hold at the same time. Uh, it is There is also literature that is very suggestive that uh, privacy and fairness don't, don't necessarily hold together. Right? Um, in some sense, it makes sense because if you if you want to ensure fairness, you have to understand where these groups fit in, like where an individual fits into a group and so on. But if you don't have that information, it's hard to understand that 
uh, your models can be accurate, right? Um, or as accurate. But that said, I think we are very early in the science here. So I, I don't want to make a strong claim that, you know, uh, fairness and privacy are simply kind of uh, incompatible. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if there is like a trade-off that you need to make. And how is Splunk specifically thinking about these trade-offs or these challenges when it comes to the products that you're building? That's a really great question. So I think uh, so when it comes to privacy, like I said, it's it's uh, a bit more scientific. We can think about it from fairness point of view. Uh, there are very many different notions of fairness, right? So, so there is individual fairness, there is group fairness. Even within group fairness, there is kind of things like group gerrymandering and so on. So it's really hard to come up with a quote unquote good notion of fairness. And also, uh, you know, uh, Splunk is in a slightly different setting uh, in the sense that the machine learning we do is often unsupervised and uh, feeds into uh, context that users can use. For example, in security, that we have user behavior detections that might be machine learning based, but they don't directly end up automating a response, right? Responses are automated based on uh, rules that trigger attacks. So, so they're not really machine learning based, but machine learning becomes a context that goes into this. So it is a bit more nuanced in how fairness shows up there, as opposed to say in advertising, right? Or, or in credit card lending and so on. Uh, so we are starting to grapple with this problem now, which is in, in the case where machine learning models end up showing up as context into something else that a human has to act upon, how does fairness actually show up there, right? So I don't have great answers on that. I think as a community, we're still grappling with it, but that is where a lot of our thinking goes in uh, what sort of fairness makes is something that we should be thinking about. How do you implement auditing for machine learning models here? And more importantly, what do you do after your audited models, right? How do you how do you make them better? Yeah, I mean, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, and the, the phrase algorithmic audit has um, skyrocketed in popularity. Uh, we see it reflected in legislation from the city of New York uh, wanting to introduce mandatory algorithmic audits to hiring-based automated decision-making systems to uh, U.S. Uh, legislation on algorithmic audits. But one really notable thing, actually, in all of this legislation is nobody has actually defined what an algorithmic audit ought to look like, even though they, you know, there actually may be bills being introduced that mandate such audits. So appreciating yeah. that this is not a solved problem, how yeah. are you thinking about the concepts of algorithmic audits and, and what the value is that they can bring to ensuring ethical AI? Yeah. Uh, that's again a great question. Like I said, it's very much unsolved. But one way to think about algorithmic audit—I mean, the reason why algorithmic audit I think is somewhat easier notion to at least put forward on the table—is uh, there, there is a sense in which if I give you a group, for example, uh, males of versus females, or uh, uh, as a group, or, or blacks and whites, and so on. Once you have identified a group, you can then look at an algorithm and say. Does this algorithm treat this these two groups unfairly, right? And and a measure for that could be, say, a false rejection rate on a credit card application, right? So that's a that's a very clear measure and a metric that, given a group, you can actually come up with this audit. What is harder is a once you do that, what do you do about it, right? So once once you've figured out that a model is maybe violating this by more than one person or some objective metric. How do you fix it? That's much harder. Mm -hmm. Secondly, even if you do that for a given group, the more challenging problem is when you have intersections of groups, right? Like the, the fairness gerrymandering, right? That is much, much harder. So you probably are going to need algorithmic methods even in figuring that out, which is even if models are known to work uh, fairly for certain groups, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to work fairly at the intersection of groups. Okay. Absolutely. So, so Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, so uh, again, these are these are more questions. I don't have answers here. These are the things we're thinking about. Uh, but I think starting with algorithmic audit is, in a sense, easier because at least you can formulate this problem and start tackling them. So, one interesting thing about algorithmic audit, and frankly, in my opinion, why nobody has really tried to put a good pin on it, is it's this odd intersection of qualitative and quantitative. So in other fields, when we have assessments, data privacy impact assessments, 
um, for example. They're purely qualitative entities. Um, and even some of the first forays into public algorithmic impact assessments, like by the government of Canada, again, purely qualitative, asks you a series of questions and then gives you a score. But yeah. you know, as a data scientist, I personally find those very unsatisfactory because you've not actually given me any empirical evidence. Um, so, you know, what, what do you think of the, the, the possible intersecting sets of skills that would be required to do an audit well? I mean, this is to say, it's not like, qualitative questions are without value, they have immense value because so much of algorithmic bias is in the context of how it is applied. However, as data scientists, you know, and frankly, regulators, et cetera, should really be thinking about the empirical evidence to illustrate that something is and is not happening. So as a field, how do we reconcile these very different skill sets that are needed yeah. to come together to perform possibly what a good audit might look like? Yeah, absolutely. I think that is one of the fundamental problems, which is computer scientists alone are not going to solve this problem, right? So just that the machine learning computer science skill set is not going to be enough to solve fairness and auditing as a problem. Uh, you do require a variety of skill sets to come together. Even in formulating, like uh, like I was mentioning in that toy, in that simple example of uh, false rejection rates and so on, even formulating what is the criterion that you're looking for requires kind of understanding of biases and so on, right? Uh, similarly, understanding the groups that are impacted uh, may require understanding of historical bias. Understanding how data is collected, uh, understanding the historical bias and how data is collected may require far more than a computer scientist's understanding or even a data scientist's understanding of data. So I, I do think that fundamentally, this is something that can't be solved by just computer scientists. This is something that requires uh, a lot of people to come together. And also notion of fairness itself is very, very tricky, right? It's as a society, we have to converge on certain notions of fairness that make sense for us. Right, right. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna pull on a thread that I started picking on earlier when I said I wanted to put a pin in the term accuracy. As a social yeah. scientist and quantitative social scientist, so I come you know, you know how the saying goes that there's data scientists or either statisticians who learn to program or programmers who learn stats. Well, I'm a yeah. statistician who learned to program and one of the most surprising things to me when I came to Silicon Valley was just this overemphasis of an R squared because it is called accuracy as like the end all and be all of all yeah. measurements of goodness of a model. And, and again, as a statistician, I found that incredibly surprising. R squared is a useful metric, but in very specific cases. I think there's this interesting, and again, back to this like qualitative and quantitative, when you say the word accuracy with somebody who doesn't understand how is good or quote accurate as the data that is put into it because it is simply a measure of how good it is right at at uh, predicting you know your yeah. your your, val your um, validation set but that's like yeah. a very but then that's a really good example of, you know, I almost think it's almost a false dichotomy to say fairness and accuracy are at odds with each other. That makes it sound like if we are trying to optimize a model to be fair, we will have less good models. But actually what it means is our fairness has identified that the data that has been put into our model is actually an inadequate data to represent the world as we, are mo as we ought to model it to be based on the way we are choosing to create our construct of the world. So it's like slightly more complicated and possibly a little less, you know, zero and one <laughs> than saying accuracy, et cetera. But it does, I, I worry sometimes that um, the overemphasis of the term accuracy, and, and there are many other ways to measure model robustness. I don't yeah. necessarily just include accuracy. So, you know, I, and I think, again, this is one of those discussions where when we think about auditing a model, what are the metrics that we choose um, to assess the value of this model. Most yeah. of the things that I'm, I'm trying to do and trying to push for is to not create this uh, environment of animosity between people making models and people assessing models for fairness. We are, are actually all trying to achieve the same goal, frankly, which is to have the best possible model, right? Yeah. The best possible model actually does include a better assessment of the world as it is, including all the ugliness of the world and appreciating yeah. that we can have limitations as a result. 
Um, so I, I think that's a really interesting, you know, and sometimes a very normative discussion of audits and the purpose of audits to kind of divorce them from a pure technical implementation. So it's great to see that you're thinking of, you know, how audits can happen in a way that's more than just, you know, finding the right metrics or measurements of correctness. So, and, so that leads to kind of another interesting topic and, and question I wanted to ask you about. So the concept of audit is usually a reactive thing. In other words, a model is often created and then it is audited. It's usually audited based on some sort of mandate by a regulatory body, some legal case, et cetera. What are the ways in which you're thinking of proactively addressing algorithmic bias? Yeah, so uh, that's that's a really great question. Um, so I think in some cases, we don't really need to wait for reactive, reactively addressing this. Uh, in some cases, we know, or at least in cases where we know that there is potential bias, we can actually go ahead and look for it, like adversarially train models against it, right? To know that models are going to be fair, or at least have an objective measure of being fair. Uh, but I would say, just given where we are at with ethics right now, we are very early uh, in terms of ethics and AI. I do expect that this is going to be like a learning process, which is, and, and something like this happened, forgetting AI, this has happened with social media platforms before, right? So when, when we built social media platforms, we were building it to optimize the engagement. Like nobody at that time thought optimizing for engagement is going to lead us here, right? So, you know, uh, and possibly if you had understood the social impact of doing that, we would have probably optimized a very different metric, right? We have thought about optimizing something very different than just engagement. I actually view ethics and AI as also kind of having that sort of progression because, because it's such a disruptive technology AI, I don't think we fully probably understand where it's going to lead us. So 10 years from now, we may look back and say, we should have done very many things differently, right? That That's going to be there. That said, based on what we can see right now, uh, there are some things that we can actually start training against and kind of guarding against in terms of biases. Uh, and that doesn't require us to wait for regulatory kind of uh, uh, auditing to be put in place. So what are the things, so, you know, a really common thing to do in our field is the, the concept of a retro, where you look back at a project that's been developed and you yeah. think, you know, it's great, this thing launched, that's wonderful, but what, what could we have improved? Thinking mm -hmm. of sort of the standard ML development process, what are the things that you think we can improve along the way to ensure that we are introducing the right kind of thinking and safeguards, um, you know, to ensure ethical AI? Yeah. So uh, we should spend a lot of time looking at the data. So whatever data feeds into models is kind of what models learn, right? I think it's really important to have a careful understanding of where biases can originate in data itself. And once it's in the data, it's much harder to remove that bias, right? Uh, then there is bias in sampling, for example. Even if data doesn't inherently have bias, the sampling methodologies you use might introduce bias. It's really important to be aware of that. Um, so every step of the machine learning pipeline can actually introduce bias. Similarly, even if you have designed an algorithm or a model from an algorithm to be as reasonably fair as possible, when you introduce it as a step into a process, fairness doesn't compose, right? So you're, you're still going to have to make, make sure that the overall end objective is fair, right? the end, end pipeline or the end model is fair. So you, you almost cannot just think of it as a compartmentalized fairness for each model sort of thing. You have to think of the whole process as being fair, and how do you go about dissecting that? Um, so that is that's the way we are thinking about it. So so it's uh, it's a much harder problem than kind of thinking about privacy, for example, because privacy composes, right? So if individual data sets are differentially private and I compose them, I still maintain some amount of differential privacy. So how, how does that translate into you know the very real day-to-day -day pressures of being somebody on a machine learning team or a product team? You know, are folks adequately yeah. incentivized to essentially do the right thing? If yeah, you know, so yeah, please. Yeah. You know, you that, that, is, that is a great question. There is always the tension between uh, developing a model and actually deploying it and getting feedback and kind of moving on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the solution is. Uh, again, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, but one of the things we think about is education, which is uh, really having our, our scientists think about the impact of a model. What is the 
what is the actual impact of putting this model into production, right? Uh, so in a sense, slowing down, actually, actually trying to do the right thing, as opposed to moving fast and breaking things, right? Which is which works in some settings, but not in ethical AI, right? Um, the other thing also is uh, in in partnering with academia and partnering with um, as broadly as possible, because I think we talked about this, which is computer scientists by themselves or, or a machine learning engineer by herself uh, building these models is simply not going to be uh, fully equipped because of the complexity of this problem, right? To be able to solve it. So yeah, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, incentives and also in, a measuring impact. There are some analogs in some of the fields you've mentioned, um, namely in security. I mean, the concept of threat modeling, I think, has been yeah. immensely helpful. Um, you know, in both privacy and security, sort of illustrate the harms. What are some good ways you think that we might be able to start thinking about an analog to threat modeling? So, in the, and the thing that I'm trying to like understand and I'm working on this myself is how, how do we start being proactive and being proactive is not, I mean, the first step is of course setting the right internal infrastructure at a company, but then second, the second problem to tackle is how do we incentivize people to actually use these structures that you've set up without making it, you know, a chore, without making it something if people are like, oh God, this annoying thing I have to do, otherwise these people are going to bother me, right? Like yeah. how, how do we inspire people to appreciate that this is all a part of good model development, the way, frankly, programmers embrace security as actually a good part of model development. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have this problem with security also, right? Which is every engineer thinks of security as a chore. It's like the last oh, step exactly. that you need to get it out of the way. Uh, but, but I think with fairness, I mean, the the... Probably the way to think about it is, and there is some literature that, uh, or some people are thinking about it that way, which is essentially making it an algorithmic problem also, which is uh, adversarially trying to break models, mm -hmm. specifically around these kind of group fairness notions. So if you have this sort of a machine learning pipeline or a, or a system uh, that actually tries to break your models, now, and that's part of everything that you have to go through. So if you have to ship a model, you kind of have to, Make sure that it doesn't break this adversary. It doesn't adversarially break this thing, right? Um, I think that's a good way to incentivize people to develop the right thing, right? It doesn't solve all problems, but it's better than nothing. So it's given where we are starting at. I think it's better than doing nothing. It's somewhat similar to what in the security world we we would do with prod ops and prod sec and so on, which is uh, there are security teams that are essentially trying to kind of break your that model, right? So they break your security model. And if they break your security security model, your application doesn't go into production. Now, instead of having human beings do that, you're essentially trying to have algorithms do this, right? Um, for certain notions of fairness that we can actually quantify in terms of these audits that we talked about. So do you think there are maybe some sort of standardized ways we can introduce in addition to sort of the human oversight yeah. Like, basically, it's like edge testing, essentially, yes. edge testing with notions of fairness, right? What if we include particular subgroups that yeah. um, we think this model may be biased against, et cetera? Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think I think it's actually really interesting, an interesting concept. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, you would probably have to do that because just given the kind of complexity of fairness criteria uh, and how how subtle they are in, in how they can be violated. I think you, you would have to come up with some kind of algorithm measure to do this. Anyway. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, one of the tensions I grapple with all the time is sort of the nature of ML and these kinds of compute models that we create is to aggregate. And yet yeah. so many of the issues we see are about disaggregated specific instances. And it doesn't it, it inherently in the construct of the system, it seems as if those hold no value or less value, but actually they hold significant value in the context of like social structures, et cetera, right? So I guess what I'm saying is we optimize models to work for the majority, and then most of the biases that we are uncovering actually occur in the minority. Yeah. And you know, it, it's it's about in in my mind the way I think about it is you actually have to look at if there is a particular pattern to the behavior in the in the cases in which your models fail. Um, and yeah. it's sort of 
taking a statistical notion of like error analysis and sort of applying it to our ML models as they as they interact in the real world. And that's that's I think the tough part sometimes, um, you know, sort of un untangling whether or not it, a model error is literally that, like a specific error in that model in that instance, or whether it is indicative of some larger problem um, that requires investigation. And, and I think that sometimes at odds with how we talk about AI and machine learning, which is as if it is 100% better 100% of the time, it's sort of the appreciating the, the error and the mistakes that are inherent to any technological system. There is no perfect computer system, but then understanding biases as the cases in which it goes wrong tend to go wrong for particular kinds of people. And yeah. almost always that maps to the people who tend to be the most vulnerable in our populations anyway. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to and like, I feel like I'm always super curious to know like, specifically what are the initiatives you're working on at Splunk? What are you excited about and how are you um, uh, illustrating the need for ethical AI and prioritizing that at your company? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, you know, it, it, because a large portion of our machine learning is focused towards security, and that's kind of where we are spending a lot of our effort this year, a lot of our thinking is also around as we start deploying these machine learning models that are more and more automating some of the core threat indicator, behavioral indicators for threat, uh, how do you make sure that those are both privacy preserving as well as fair? And those those are equally important for us, right? So, which is Splunk takes security extremely seriously, and uh, when we build models, we want to make sure that uh, these models that are trained on customer data, for example, are not leaking information. Similarly, uh, they are not biased in any way uh, when they are used as indicators for threat. So that's where most of our work is going on this year is in the intersection of machine learning and security. Uh, um, that sounds great. So, you know, moving forward, do you have any thoughts on bringing in or learning from some of that framework towards adopting ethics frameworks? Absolutely. I mean, uh, right now, again, we are very uh, early in the space, so we are evaluating a lot of ethics frameworks today. Uh, I, I don't have a good kind of answer right now, but yes, 100% um, it's something that we're looking at. Yeah, um, and if there's something about, I would say, the ethics and fairness space that you think is going to be kind of the next big thing, folks ask me this all the time. Um, I'm curious to know what your answer is, and then I will give you, I will give you my answer. What, what do you think will be like the next big thing in the field of applied fairness, ethics, et cetera? I think the notion of individual fairness is something that is uh, less researched, and I think it's probably at the end of the day, I think we need to understand that. Uh, a lot of the research and a lot of even semi-practical implementations of ethics in AI focuses around group ethics, like group fairness. Um, and there's a lot of problems with that. Um, I think given the amount of data we collect and given, given the sort of big data problems we deal with in machine learning, uh, there is a, there's an opportunity to really refine the notions around individual fairness. And I think that's kind of where uh, I am I think there'll be a big advances. There's always a lot of really interesting um, applied work coming out in that field. My answer has probably been the same for the past few years. I'm waiting for, for, for I'm waiting to be right. Uh, I would really love to see more causal modeling applied. Um, I mean, I, I never like to consider things to be like a holy grail of everything, but I think causal modeling will help us significantly reduce a lot of the spurious data that's being used um, and, and which will actually resolve or at least move us towards more uh, analysis of you know issues of privacy, security, as well as ethics, because it will bring into question what we're collecting, why we're using the data we're using, et cetera. So I always hope that you know it will be the year for causality to really explode. Um, it hasn't necessarily happened yet, just because by nature, it's quite a difficult thing to move from theory into practice. I can fully appreciate the complexities of it, um, but I'm really hoping for that. I think in the short term, um, the big discussion I'm starting to see, and I think you talked about how sometimes privacy and fairness are at odds, uh, and you're correct. If we're trying to understand if something is biased against a particular gender or minority, we would 
in most cases today, we would actually have to have that information, which could be a violation of privacy, right? Again, we're, we're not talking about individual research, we're talking about big corporations saying, give me this information about you, and presumably yeah. I will, quote, understand if my models are fair, but then from a privacy perspective, you're like, okay, well now you have this information about me, uh, what else can you be using it for? And, you know, from a, a trust perspective, that's really important, and, and often it's better to just say we're not going to collect that information because we value the trust you have and how difficult it is to see how we're using this data. You can only trust what I tell when I tell you we're not using it. People have no way of verifying, which is yeah. probably the most important thing here. The average person cannot verify how data is being used. So I, I hope that we see more research into understanding notions of fairness without having to have actually the actual variables, the actual data around it. There's been like some early really interesting work um, using adversarial techniques to be able to figure out subgroup unfairness. Um, and the other thing, and I don't know enough about the literature that I hope that that does is because it seems to be construct agnostic and more about patterns in the data, um, we may even be able to kind of go around some of the problems that arise in categorization. In other words, if I want to understand if something is fair or unfair, and I only, you know, categorize race in terms of two races, black and white, like what, where, where are less and less in that in that assessment? And maybe the unfairness is manifesting itself on indigenous populations or Asian population. Right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that would be that would be really interesting. Um, so I do know where we're a little bit up on time. I really appreciate you taking some time out and having this chat. Um, really excited to see that Splunk is valuing ethical AI and, and bringing it into all the work you're doing. And I'm sure you have an incredibly busy day ahead. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks a lot. It's been great talking to you. Thank you very much.